second reading for tonight is from the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 9. And it is a tradition. I know you just sat down. Please stand up. You know, you're obviously getting too relaxed there. You need to burn off a little more calories. But honestly, this is a form of, of honoring the good news of the teachings of our Master, Jesus the Messiah. Brothers and sisters, the good news according to St. Matthew. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon the Zealot and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Do not get any gold, or silver, or copper to take with you in your belts. No bag for the journey, or extra shirt, or sandals, or a staff. For the worker is worthy of his keep. Whatever town or village you enter, search there for some worthy person, and stay at their house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. If any, anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Truly, I tell you, it'll be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. I am sending you out like sheep among the wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and you'll be flogged in the synagogues. On my account, you'll be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say. For it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death and his father, his ch child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. You'll be hated by everyone because of me. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. Truly, I tell you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, be seated.
Let's begin prayer. Father, we ask that um, indeed you would give us each one eyes to see and ears to hear. And we pray that you'll speak to us through your word. And we ask that uh, you will not only deepen our understanding, but encourage us, strengthen our faith, and Lord, when necessary, bring us correction. And we do ask this in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Our passage uh, this evening um, follows, I think, very nicely with the previous two Sundays. And two weeks ago, we discussed, or our reading was a great commission. It was on Trinity Sunday, and uh, the great commission allowed us uh, an opportunity, not so much to speak about the Trinity, but to speak about the text, Matthew 28, and to speak about the nature of discipleship. And uh, one of the things that we did point out was that discipleship really and truly is much more than a program or a notebook or course that one might take at a church. And again, all those things certainly have some value. But it, uh, discipleship is first and foremost about a person and it's about our attachment to that person or the way that we belong to that person. And um, what is it that we have to do uh, to stay attached and deepen, um, deepen that uh, attachment? And we spoke about the importance of imitation, but not simply imitation, but the way that we are invited, yes, to participate uh, in the life that the Son has with the Father. That's called divine life or eternal life. And it's also, we also pointed out that what's very critical uh, and somewhat radical, no, not somewhat, very, very radical, that while Jesus patterns discipleship or his understanding of the way discipleship should be practiced was very Jewish, very, in some ways, very typical of what uh, others did uh, during his day. The departure is that at the end of Matthew's gospel, Jesus says that I'm sending you out as disciples to make other disciples and yes, I'm going to be with you always. Yes, there are many rabbis and teachers and professors and mentors, yes, that have uh, gone before us and will come after us, and uh, many will have a good and positive influence. Yes, they'll leave a legacy, a tradition, but none of us, none of them are going to, yes, be present with us, be Emmanuel, be in our midst, and so the, the, Jesus in this understanding of discipleship is, um, his understanding of discipleship is, is essential that we grasp what he had in common during his day or with his uh, contemporaries and what was different. And last week, Aaron spoke uh, about righteousness and he spoke uh, about uh, the understanding of righteousness of, of, uh, of righteousness, and uh, he referred to Malachi 6.4, that talks 6.5, that talks about the righteous acts of the Lord. And uh, he very correctly pointed out that the word righteousness has many shades of meaning, many shades of meaning, and it's not always referring to some moral standard or high moral standard, uh, but it can have this understanding 
that when we talk about God's righteousness, we're talking about God's redemptive activity. We're talking about uh, God's um, activity on behalf of his people to save them, to provide for them, to care for them, to protect them, and more. Yes, and it's on those two Sundays that uh, I like to build and go just a little bit, a little bit further. Because the passage that we have um, before us is and should be understood and that you might say the wider picture of Matthew's gospel. In chapter four, when Jesus begins his ministry, Matthew chapter four, he calls the disciples. And after calling the disciples in verse 33, it tells us that Jesus went through Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom. And please note that term. It's a term that I think only Matthew uses. Preaching good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. And so the activities listed here, preaching or teaching, preaching, and not just preaching any old thing, preaching this good news of the kingdom and teaching, I'm oh, sorry, and healing. And chapter four ends, and then chapter five through seven is the famous Sermon on the Mount, and uh, Jesus begins teaching. He begins teaching his disciples, not just the, some nice axioms, how to live, blessed are the poor in spirit, but he's teaching them in essence, yes, he's teaching them what is actually the heart of the kingdom of heaven, or what is the heart of the kingdom of God. And the Sermon on the Mount is a sermon about the kingdom. And then after this teaching, we have Jesus who begins to preach and to proclaim and to heal. And this is what happens in chapters eight and then and then chapter is nine. So you might say that Jesus teaches the kingdom. Yes, teaches about the kingdom. We have uh, Jesus preaching the kingdom, uh, pro or pro proclaiming. We have Jesus uh, demonstrating the kingdom in his healing and his, his exorcisms. And uh, a little bit later in Matthew, Jesus will illustrate the kingdom with his parables, especially in chapter 13. This is the focus of Jesus, right? Jesus is focused on the message of the kingdom and he's focused on discipleship in this, um, in this gospel. And so we come to chapter nine, which began our reading in verse 35. And it says that Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching again in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. And then it goes on to say, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. So what is the motivation of Jesus? Yes. And ultimately, what should be our motivation for any form of ministry? How many of us have ever heard it said, we better get out there and preach. Jesus is coming soon. Yes, Jesus is coming soon. Or maybe, if we are really honest about it, somehow our ego or the way that we understand ourselves, or maybe it's our career trajectory path is somehow bound up or, or connected in an unfortunate way with ministry. We can have many different motives, but here the motive of Jesus is compassion. It's compassion. And the, the Gospels make it very clear, right, that uh, not just in Matthew's Gospels, but in all the Gospels, right, that Jesus is some, moved, by, moved with pity. 
In chapter 9, there's other instances of Jesus being moved with compassion. In chapter 14 in Matthew, Jesus looks upon uh, heels because, uh, brings healing uh, to many because he's moved with compassion. Jesus feeds the 5,000 because he sees the crowd and he knows they're hungry. Jesus heals a man in Mark chapter 1 um, who is a leper and uh, it's Jesus is moved with compassion. Jesus is moved with compassion when he meets uh, the, a widow whose only son, yes, her social security, her old age pension has died. There's no one there to care for her or there's going to be no one there to, to provide for her. And right out of compassion, Jesus um, not only brings healing, but raises this young man from the dead. Yeah, in the same chapter, there's a woman with an issue of blood who's healed by Jesus, right? And these healings, by the way, are not only something physical, yes, they're healing, healing it comes to people in emotional distress, People, uh, healing comes to people who are socially ostracized. That woman with the issue of blood, she was, in a sense, an outcast because she was ritually unclean and she had no business right, being in public or being in contact with anyone. Right? She was isolated. Uh, she was shunned. And Jesus not just not only healed her physically, but he also healed her socially. Yes, right? There, there's a concern that sometimes we don't pick up on that uh, in the healing ministry of Jesus or the teaching ministry of Jesus, or even in, this, in our proclamation of the kingdom of heaven, that there is a concern for the dignity of human people and the welfare of, of the human family that is more than something simply physical. Yes? Now, where does this compassion come from? All right? Well, on one hand, as we can read through the scripture, dozens and dozens of places where it says we have words similar to these. I haven't counted them recently, but I think at one time I may have found it either 10 or 12 uh, paraphrases of what God says to Moses in Exodus, in Exodus 34. He said, uh, the Lord came down in a cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yes? What Jesus is simply reflecting is the character of God and perfectly reflecting the character of God, right? And you might say uh, God's brokenheartedness right, for the human condition or what sin has done to us, what sin has done to his creation. But also I'd like to uh, suggest something else. And also Jesus learned this compassion at home. And who did he learn compassion from? And uh, ironically enough, it's Father's Day in many parts of the world, or at least in the part of the world that counts to, to, to some people in the United States. Yes. Where did Jesus learn compassion? He learns it from Joseph. Because in Matthew chapter 1, it tells us that Joseph is a righteous man. And that Joseph does not want to shame Mary. And he wants to divorce her quietly. He doesn't want to run through the village and say to everyone, look what she's done to me. Look how she's ruined my reputation. Yes, he's compassionate. Yes, let's do this quietly. I don't know if, if, uh, if we ever think about it perhaps deeply enough, 
But Jesus had some amazing parents. Yes, he had, a, he had a father who was compassionate and righteous, who obviously, in this case, seems to have had very high ethical moral standards. He had a mother who said yes to God in the most difficult of circumstances. And she, it cost her for the rest of her life. Or she's going to be slandered and, and misunderstood. And Jesus can say, and some, and Jesus can say yes to the cross, and to its suffering, and to all the consequences, because he had a mother, who actually before him, did the same. Yes, who did something very, very unpopular, but in the end obeyed God's will. So here Jesus is compassionate. And this compassion, yes, is what he's trying to teach his disciples. Yes, the, 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 the discipleship is not merely getting by, you know, listening to Bible lectures, listening to podcasts, right? Discipleship is imitating the life of the master. And of course, it can't necessarily all be done in a classroom or it can't be done you know, in the study cell, right? One has to live and to be present with the teacher. And it's not something that's always taught. Perhaps it's caught. Yes, it's caught. So the disciples are learning compassion. But at the same time, you know, Jesus wants to, I think, uh, push, the, push this further. And so he calls the 12 disciples in verse 10. And he says, and he gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. Now, without a long commentary on this, that he calls 12, 12 disciples and turns them into apostles, yes, turns them into sent ones, they're no longer just students or apprentices. They're now going to put what Jesus has taught them into practice. But the number 12 reminds us again and again, yes, that we can't understand the ministry of Jesus. We certainly can't understand his main message, which is the message of the kingdom of heaven. All of this doesn't really make sense the gospel doesn't make sense. The gospel of the kingdom doesn't make sense unless it's understood in the context of creation and the context of the story of Israel. Yes? What is the gospel? You ask people, oh, it's about God's mercy and grace and how I get saved. Well, I don't think so. Part of, partially, that's true. But that's not the big picture. The big picture is that God, through Abraham and the prophets of Israel, and working through the Jewish people, right, promises rescue and redemption. And this rescue and redemption comes to us through Jesus, who is indeed the universal Lord and Savior. But as we mentioned more than once this year. He is not the universal Lord and Savior in spite of his Jewishness or his Jewish identity. And by the way, he still maintains a Jewish identity in heaven at this moment. He is universal Lord and Savior because of his Jewish identity. Because of his Jewish identity. And the message of the kingdom Yes, that these disciples, now apostles, are supposed to go and proclaim the message of the kingdom is not a message about the world to come, and it's not a message about um, the uh, second coming of Jesus. Instead, it is a message that God, in and through his son, this Jesus of Nazareth, right, is now taking control of what's rightfully his. What's what, and what is rightfully his? 
creation and God, God in and through Jesus is beginning to rule and reign. Yes, and this might, you might say it comes to its almost its culmination, and maybe not the final culmination in the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. King Jesus sits on the throne and takes charge over those people who say yes to him. He doesn't force, he doesn't push, he doesn't manipulate, but he invites. He invites. And wherever, or usually where you have the kingdom of heaven, or the message of the kingdom of heaven, and I suspect about 80 to 85% of the time it's mentioned in the gospels, it is a present reality. Where you have the message of the kingdom of heaven, King Jesus is always at work redeeming. He's always at work restoring. He's always at work bringing reconciliation. He's always at work purifying our lives from sin. Yes, he's at work freeing us from the fear of death. He is at work freeing us from the bondage of Satan. He's at work freeing us from our self-centeredness or our anxieties or our addictions. And that was what Aaron so wonderfully spoke about last week. Yes, because the, 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 Matthew's gospel says, Jesus says in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. And that's a very beautiful parallel. Jesus is telling us, hey, major on majors. Don't get caught up in some, a lot of minor stuff. Yeah? Major on majors. Major on the kingdom of heaven. And then we, could, we might say, but what is the kingdom of heaven? Well, his righteousness, yes, is a parallel that helps us define the kingdom of heaven. And God's righteousness in this case, yes, is best to be understood and translated as the way it is in Micah. The saving acts of the Lord focus on the kingdom of heaven and his saving acts. What saving acts? Again, yes, healing, the call to repentance, yes, a victory over Satan. This is what we need to focus on. This is what needs to be our major concern. And when Jesus sends out the 12, and again in the, this context of Israel's story, yes, when he sends out this, these 12, right, he's sending them out to major on majors to be focused on what is really important and not to be caught up in the trivial. That's the focus. And here, yes, he's given them authority. Obviously, it's the Holy Spirit. But I want to go back to the point of compassion because I think it's really important here because this, be, this is the basis of the ministry of Jesus. It should be the basis of all that we do and it should be the basis of our, in a sense, of our discipleship. So what makes these people these 12 automatically so compassionate. In fact, you know, they could have a bit of a different attitude. After all, they could say, hey, we're special. We're hanging out with this Jesus guy. You know, he's the superstar featured every week on Netflix in The Chosen. <clears throat> yeah, we're hanging out with this Jesus guy. You know, he's good looking, he's got uh, he's doing wonderful miracles, you know. You should you, you should uh, see his HMO. There's no copay, no wait, no way, you know, waiting for an operation, and his free lunches are incredible. Oh, and I'll tell you, the entertainment, you know, Netflix, The Chosen, has nothing on the real Messiah. I mean, what marvelous, incredible stories! Man, we, we're pretty hip, we're pretty privileged. We're not like those slobs over there, you know, who they were never chosen. 
They were never asked to follow along and help Jesus. I mean, boy, what the things we're seeing are incredible. We were surely somebody. And after all, I'm sure, no doubt he chose us because, you know, either we're special or we've got it together. And surely he must have recognized that. You know, well, a few of us might have a few problems here and there. And he sends them out. But notice, yes, notice, yes, what is, you might say, the heart of this message. You could say, oh, it's, for he it's healing. And it's true. He sends people out, to, he sends his disciples out to heal. But not everyone gets physically healed. And we don't know why. And even those people who got physically healed in this, uh, and, and the Gospels probably got sick again and died. Yeah, there's something m more behind the healing stories than just the physical healing. And we could say, yes, this points to the Messiah. This tells us really who he is. Okay. But also there's something here for us. And that is Jesus sends these 12 out to do what? He sends them out to live and to be a, a part of the lives of the people that, yes, they're to minister to. And so when that happens, yes, it's pretty hard to start thinking, well, I'm better than them, or I've got it together, and they don't, you know. I, um, you know, uh, thank God I'm, I'm not like them. You know, I, I, can, <clears throat> I can minister, you know, and go back to the hotel. I can uh, stand up for the oppressed. I can give up my cappuccino, you know, at uh, Starbucks today and donate my $8.25, you know, to the Kurdish Liberation Front or for women suffering with breast cancer. I can put a bumper sticker on my car. I can, you know, rant and rage on Facebook, you know, all those people who don't care about the poor, you know. What do we call that? Virtual signaling, yes. And the society is full of it. In some ways, people are very sincere. Yes, they want to stand for those who are downtrodden or those who are oppressed or those whose human rights have been taken away. But at the same time, most people are not willing to make any kind of serious commitment. And Jesus says, uh-uh, you go and live with these people. You go and stay in their houses. You make yourself dependent upon their generosity and their goodwill. You, you see their life, you know, or experience the life that they have on the ground. That's where empathy comes from. That's where compassion will come from. Because it's no longer the words of Pink Floyd. Yeah, us and them, yes. It's us and us, yeah? We, like Jesus, who identifies with the human condition, who identifies with those who are sick, or those who are hungry, or those who are ostracized, those who are locked into the demonic, right? And it's from that motivation that we can love and minister and be a part of the solution tell you a story. Um, there's a minister from South Africa, who's a friend of mine, Cape Town, very wealthy, wealthy parish. And they had a ministry to, to township, to, to a township where they had a clinic, uh, etc. And uh, one day, two very wealthy women came to the minister, to the Anglican guy, and said, we want to go and serve the poor. And so my friend very wisely said, okay, you take a, you have someone drop you off and you arrange for someone to pick you up in three or four days. Don't you take any money with you and don't take a credit card. And you go and you serve those people. Yeah, you know, 
And when you have a problem, don't throw money at it. Or don't take out your credit card and try to fix it. You live their lives. And all of a sudden, <clears throat> these women get to the clinic, and there's a woman who's just about to have a baby. And she has no money to find a taxi to take her to a hospital. And none of the taxi drivers are going to take her without money. All of a sudden, these women, as I heard later, really understood you know, what was at stake. Okay? They understood. They became part of the context. Right? And they had to virtually get on their knees and pray for some solution. Right? And they stayed there. And I think, in a sense, this is what Jesus is telling his, telling his disciples to do. Yes? This is where we learn empathy and we learn compassion by identifying, yes, with those who are like us uh, and, yet at, and who need mercy and grace like us. Yet at the same time, we don't um, say to people, hey, I understand your problem. Oh, I understand, you know, your addiction. I understand your sexual confusion. You know, I want to empathize with you. No, there's empathy. But that empathy, yes, enables us in, a, in, a, in, in humility to call people to repentance. To call people to repentance and to transformation. You know, so often today, if you, you know, go on the internet, it's you know, there is a rage and an anger and it's those people and, you know, those Democrats, those Republicans, those, no, 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 no. And it's, a, you know, this is your fault and your problem and we would be better off if somehow you didn't exist. It's not the way of Jesus. Or I'm going to use force to change you. I'm going to pass a law. You know, Jesus is actually modeling something else. And then let's go back to, to what Jesus says. When he sees the crowds and he's full of compassion, what does he say? He says, they are harassed and, and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And no doubt Jesus is referring to, yes, or connecting Yes, this to Ezekiel 34, our first reading this morning. Yes, he has compassion because people are misguided and they're misdirected and they're confused. And this confusion, of course, moral, spiritual, even more is costly and destructive in the lives. And so he doesn't just throw up his hands and say, well, there's nothing I can do about it. He says the following. He says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And since most of us have no connection with agriculture anymore, because thankfully it's done by big corporations for us, and we don't have to worry, unless we want to pick cherries during cherry season, you might change the, the imagery the house is on fire, you know. Pray that the, the city can find more f fire personnel. I don't want to be politically incorrect here. Fire personnel, yes, more fire department employees to put out, yeah, what is a very, very big blaze. Or the game isn't going very well, you know. Pray that we can put in more players or whatever it may be. Yes. So Jesus, the solution is pray. Pray that workers will go in to the harvest. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send workers into his harvest field. Now, notice this. Yes. First of all, pray. And then secondly, ask the Lord to send workers in. Have you ever noticed that it's not just about sending workers, 
but it's actually about sending the right kind of workers. And what kind of workers do we want to, to go into this harvest field? Well, I would trust or I would hope that the kind of people that we want are actually disciples, right? Disciples who are being transformed and changed. Yes, just as these disciples were. These disciples were listening to the teaching of Jesus. They were watching him. Yes, being moved with, being moved with compassion. Um, they were listening attentively to what he had to say. Right? See, Jesus says don't. He says, oh, well, when we think of preparation, oh, you know, don't take along any gold or silver or copper in your belts. Take no bag. And we think, yeah, no preparation. No, the, the disciples weren't prepared in that way. They didn't have the mission agency behind them. They, didn't, they hadn't raised all their support. You know, they uh, you know, didn't answer their, their, they didn't send out their newsletter to their donors. That they didn't do, but they were prepared in another way or being prepared in another way. And so it's praying that the right people go out. And it's also, we also need to be reminded that it's the Lord's harvest. It's not ours. It is not ours, right? This belongs to him and this is his work. Now I'm reminded, this is a little bit unusual, but I'm reminded of a Jewish saying that's written in the Mishnah. The Mishnah is written in the year 220, which I think parallels this and in some ways captures this scene from a different angle. And uh, I'd like to read it to you because I think it helps us to fully... So I'll ask Joseph to put up the slide. Joseph, if we have it. Okay, so <clears throat> this appears in a, a book called, uh, uh, something called Avot or the Fathers. It was recorded in the year 220, um, 220, um, and it obviously circulated before that. So we have a rabbi, Tarfon, and he said, the day is short. The task is great. The laborers are lazy. The wage is generous and the master is urgent. He used to say, you are not obligated to finish the task, yet you are not free to cease from it. A reward will be given you, for faithful is your employer who shall pay you the reward for your labor. And know that this reward for the righteous will be given in the world to come. Yes. And I think this sums up something um, that uh, is reflected in this passage. Yes, the work is great. Here it says the, the laborers are, work, are lazy. Jesus said the laborers are not enough. Yes, the work is overwhelming. And in fact, if we just kind of look at the moment and if we live in a crisis, which we do thanks to 24-hour news and uh, WhatsApp and email and social media, right? We live in such a crisis that we can no longer have a long perspective on anything. So if you live in such a, it's very easy to look around and to look at the, the, the number of people who've never heard about the Lord, look at the number of Christians who aren't really disciples or being discipled to look at the uh, degradation and sin, whatever it may be, um, hunger, poverty, and more, and to just become discouraged and to become hopeless and want to give up. But uh, the saying here is that the Lord is urgent. And I think it's true with Jesus. Jesus is urgent, yes, that we, yes, out of compassion, yes, for the uh, 
you might say, for the, the human condition or the way that uh, the devil is, uh, uh, the sin, the devil in the world is destroying people and destroying the lives of people. Jesus is urgent at the message of the kingdom of heaven, yes, and his um, redemptive power uh, that comes when people say yes to him, right, began to reverse, yes, the curse that uh, is found uh, throughout the human, throughout the human family. And as the rabbi says, you know, it's, the work is great and we can't become discouraged or we can't give up because we have no right to say, I'm going to quit or this is too much for us. I'm sure Jesus would have no, uh, wouldn't have any disagreement with this in the slightest. Yes. His message of the kingdom, again, is one of healing and restoration. And people come in submission to him. And we need to be urgent about that message. We need to be focused about that message. We need to major on the majors. Yes, major on what's important. And um, not to be discouraged. Yes. Uh, we do what he asks us to do. He calls us. All of us are called. The question is, where are we called? Yes. To whom are we called? Yes. What are the circumstances? Yes. And we have to listen and be obedient to that. Yes. But uh, that call has to be done Yes, not for some kind of personal advantage, but it has to be done, again, out of, out of compassion. We do not have that compassion. We need to ask the Lord to teach it to us um, and to help us to learn it. And it may not be a Holy Spirit download. It may be that we are called to, um, to live and serve among people uh, whom we may have no sympathy for or empathy for. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we ask that again that uh, indeed that you would be among us, that, that Jesus would continue his work of uh, discipling us and maturing us and bringing us that transformation so that uh, indeed we can um, be those ones who teach and preach and bring uh, your healing touch to a very, very needy world around us. And we do ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.